Uh, we're going to continue our study in Luke, so open your New Testaments to uh, Luke uh, chapter 12. We're going to read verses 22 through, 20, through 34. In verse 21, remember, it's been two weeks, uh, the Lord introduced the theme of treasure, uh, treasure for oneself versus being rich toward God. That theme is not cast off now, but undergirds this passage that follows. Continuing the contrast between the true uh, disciples who focus on uh, the wealth to be had in our great God and the self-absorbed, pleasure-worshiping people of the world. And that theme will continue in verse 34 uh, or culminate, I should say, in verse 34. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So let's read uh, the passage beginning in verse 22. He said to his disciples, For this reason I say to you, <clears throat> do not worry about your life as to what you will eat, nor for your body as to what you will put on. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. They have no storeroom nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable you are than the birds. And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his lifespan? If then you cannot do even a very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? Consider the lilies how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, but I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass in the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, you men of little faith? And do not seek what you will eat and what you will drink, and do not keep worrying. For all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek. But your Father knows that you need these things. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to charity. Uh, make yourselves money belts which do not wear out. You can tell he's, he's speaking figuratively here. Make, make yourselves money belts which, will not, which do not wear out. An unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Uh, worry is a sin, says one sinner to another. <laughs> In a class like this, I doubt there is one who has not memorized Philippians uh, 4, 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and, uh, to, and the peace of God, <laughs> I said we all have it memorized, every time I try to do that, <laughs> no matter if I do have it memorized, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. How often uh, we remind ourselves of that, don't we? Uh, but the gap between knowing we ought not to worry and actually not worrying tends to vary, sadly, according to circumstances. Worldliness is a sin, says the sinner uh, to uh, the other sinners. Uh, Do not love the world nor the things in the world, wrote the Apostle John in 1 John 2.15. For all that is in the world, the, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. 
Well, these are the two themes, worry and worldliness, that emerge out of these verses we have just read. They are connected, of course. Uh, the opposite of worry is faith, at least faith at rest, while the opposite of worldliness is devotion to God and to his kingdom. So both operate in the realm of a man or woman's spirit vying to keep in step with the Spirit of God. Our passage does not come upon us suddenly, but rather follows Jesus' warning against greed and the selfish pursuit of material goods exemplified in the parable of the rich fool. And now he turns again specifically to his disciples and he says, for this reason I say uh, to you. Uh, the sad example of the rich fool was directed primarily, remember, uh, toward the greedy heir of verse 13, who was obsessed about the distribution of his inheritance. But the same warning against misplaced priorities applies equally to all those who would aspire to be followers of Christ. And so from greed, he turns now uh, to worry. Greed, as Leon Morris wrote, can never get enough. Worry is afraid it may not have enough. For this reason I say to you, do not worry about your life as to what you will eat, nor for your body as to what you will put on. For life is more than food and the body more than, any, than clothing. Uh, daily needs and the resources to provide for them were of significant concern to the people of Jesus' generation. The very most comfortable of the citizens of Galilee and its environs uh, would, had be, would have been awestruck if somehow they had been transported into the 21st century Western world, uh, where even the poorest seldom lack for food or clothing, and most have at their disposal cell phones and big screen TVs. Few of us actually are worried about whether we'll be able to eat or have clothing. I know there are exceptions, but you get my point. Uh, few of us uh, worry about those things. And yet it seems that most of the people we run into in the course of our daily lives are forever and always afflicted with <coughs> angst. In our prosperous world, it's more common that one might worry, not because he's destitute and, and cannot afford to eat or be clothed, but because he is worldly. So we might as well go ahead and say it. Uh, God will most, almost assuredly give to us food and drink and clothes. It just may not be the fine dining and sartorial splendor uh, we would aspire to. When Cindy and I uh, were a young uh, couple here uh, at the chapel. We had a, a couple's Bible study that met in the individual homes of the different members. And we would uh, choose a book that we all agreed we'd like to study. And then we'd meet. I can't remember if it was once every two weeks or how often we met. And then the host would sort of lead the discussion of, of, the, of the book study, and then we would have prayer requests at the end, and, and, we'd, and we'd have prayer. Uh, several m men in the study were uh, in the real estate business back then, and it was the time in our lives when that business had fallen on, fallen on hard times here in, in Texas, and our prayer requests tended to follow our worries. Uh, not too long ago, I pulled one of those books that we had studied off my shelf and started thumbing through it, and we had scribbled the prayer requests in uh, the back of, of the book. And, and guess what all the prayer requests had to do with? That deal in uh, Flower Mound, uh, that, that loan package that we had to prepare, that, that deal in the mid-cities, that deal out by the 
airports. It was comical reading through uh, my own uh, prayer requests uh, at the time. And so uh, here and there were, were prayers for contentment. <laughs> so you, you could almost transport yourself back in time. Uh, well, one night, one of the ladies in the group uh, whose husband uh, was a, a real estate broker <clears throat> was pouring her heart out about the challenges uh, facing them because of the downturn in her husband's business and, you know, helpful friends that we were, several of our group began, talk, began talking about these things that we've just read about uh, out of Luke chapter 12 and also, as you know, Matthew chapter uh, 6. And I'm sure someone quoted Philippians 4, uh, 6 as well. When suddenly uh, she burst out but the Lord doesn't want us to be paupers, does he? <laughs> well, it's an easy trap to fall into. In our incredibly wealthy society, we are quick uh, to fall victim to the enticing siren call of the pleasures of the world. Uh, on the television screen, in the magazines, on social media, uh, we're bombarded with the images of the good life and the happiness that can be ours if only we can gain just a little bit more than we have at the moment and, and elevate ourselves above you know, that pauper uh, status. The context of our passage being treasure, you know, where exactly is your treasure? Uh, there is a great lesson in Jesus' insightful observation in verse 23. Life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Our possessions are important, but they must never take on the supreme importance in our lives. Concern for them should never distract us from what is to be our chief occupation. There is more to life than food and clothing. Life ultimately depends upon God and upon His Word, And that's the first reason for not anxiously worrying about material things. But still, almost all of us, uh, to varying degrees, at some time in our lives, worry about we're, how we're going to, quote, make ends meet. And so the Lord offers a second reason <clears throat> in verse 24 with an amenori argument, an argument from the lesser to uh, the greater. If God provides for the ravens uh, who neither sow nor reap and have neither storeroom nor barn, how much more valuable are you to him than those birds? We don't have a lot of ravens or, or crows even, it seems, around here. At least I don't think so. Some of you live out in the country. Maybe you do, but uh, we have grackles. Uh, which uh, with their squawking and general messiness are reportedly as irritating as crows. But the bird that Jesus talks about was one of the unclean animals according to Leviticus 11:15, uh, And because it had not been uh, disciplined, uh, it did not have the disciplined habits that the farmer has who would sow seed and then he would reap uh, its fruit in order to feed the family, it had no need for storehouses or barns either. Yet God feeds them, uh, Jesus says. His conclusion is obvious. His disciples are more important to Jesus than these unclean birds, so they not, ought not to worry about what they are to eat. God will provide for them. This might seem like elementary stuff, I know, but we do well uh, during those anxious times that come upon us. And I know that, uh, that uh, is the experience of every one of us. It, it would do us well when those times come to remember that God has everything under control. And that means everything. That, that seems to be the gist of what the Lord says next in verses 25 and 26. And which of you by worrying can add a single hour to his lifespan. 
if you then cannot do even a very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? Well, you can tell by the notes in your Bible, probably in the margin, uh, that verse 25 contains a couple of words capable of more than one meaning. The alternate reading would be much of you, which of you by worrying can add a single cubit to his height. So one word then, helikia, is translatable by either lifespan, or as my translation has it, or by height or stature. Uh, the former use but that's reflected in my translation uh, can be illustrated by the story of the man born blind in John chapter 9, where you remember uh, the Jewish leaders came to his parents uh, and very frustrated and wanted to know from his parents, you know, what, what, what's happened here? How has this man suddenly uh, gained his sight? And they s said uh, insolently, I think, back to the Jewish leaders, ask him, uh, he's of age. Helikia, that's the word they use, he's of age. The other word, uh, pekus, is the biblical word of measurement we know as a cubit. Uh, a cubit's measure was derived from the distance from a man's elbow to the tips of his fingers, or about 18 inches. I did that exercise yesterday at my desk, it's pretty close. But the word uh, was occasionally used metaphorically for a unit of time, typically an hour of time. Since it's unlikely that anyone could have related to a desire to be 18 inches taller than height, Zacchaeus maybe, but most people don't want to be 18 inches higher in, taller in height, the more likely thing the Lord intended was adding a unit of time to one's life, and hence our translation here, which of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life's span? You know, we speak of the milestones of our lives. Well, worry will not grant us more milestones. William Hendrickson said, a man may worry himself to death, but he cannot worry himself into a longer span of life. Worry is futile is what the Lord is saying. It will get you nowhere. And for emphasis, he repeats it in a different way in verse 26. If then you cannot do even a very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? Mickey Rivers was a, a great baseball player. Uh, he, he had a habit of uh, splattering hits in the gaps and turning them into doubles. Uh, and he, like Yogi Berra, uh, he was a master of ridiculous uh, quips. And one of his most famous was about uh, worry. Rivers played for the Yankees, and then he played for the, the Rangers. So the, a lot of us in here remember Mickey Rivers. But one of his most famous quips was about worry. He said, ain't no sense worrying about things you got control over, because if you got control over them, ain't no sense worrying. <laughs> and there ain't no sense worrying about things you got no control over either, because if you got no control over them, ain't no sense worrying. <laughs> well, he left out the most important part, but still, that's pretty good theology, or philosophy at least. The God who determines the length of our lives will take care of everything in between as well. Jesus was a master at bringing <clears throat> significant truths to life by illustrating them in the common things of our lives. So having pointed his disciples to the birds of the air, he now turns to uh, plant life in verse 27. It's the familiar lilies of the field. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, but I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass in the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, you men of little faith? 
It was in a Greek exegesis class on the Sermon on the Mount, which Dr. Johnson taught that he, he told his students of the note uh, taped to a broken washing machine at a Baptist seminary. It read, this machine filleth with water, but it toileth not, neither does it spin. <laughs> I wasn't going to let this opportunity go by without pulling that one out. Uh, but this is another argument from the lesser to uh, the greater. Uh, these are wildflowers the Lord is speaking of. Dan has often talked about living in Israel and the springtime when the time is exactly right where uh, the season and the weather align, how these beautiful wildflowers will emerge and, uh, but they don't last. Uh, soon they uh, shrivel up and die, or they're mown under, and they're but a memory, or they're a photograph that you took, or as was the case in this rural, pre-technological world, they're bundled up to use as fuel for the furnace. But for their brief lifespans, they're capable of taking your breath away. I would submit, since we are now transitioning from autumn to winter, that the colors of the fall uh, make the same point. We've just emerged from another gorgeous uh, fall here in Dallas-Fort Worth. Uh, day after day, we've remarked on the beauty of the fall colors, but soon every leaf is on the ground and there's nothing but bare uh, branches and the oranges and the yellows and the reds that were so, so gorgeous three, four weeks ago, they're suddenly gone. But the Lord's point is the same as with the birds. The, the transient wildflowers are clothed by our Creator in splendor surpassing Solomon in all his glory. If he will do that for them, these transitory wildflowers, Will he who is our Savior not much more clothe you, you who are his very own children? Someone has observed that all our fears are caused by calculating without God. Jesus says, O oh, men of little faith, whenever we see that epithet, O oh, you of little faith, used in the New Testament, it's always directed toward Jesus' disciples. He expects more from us. In verse 29, we have what appears as something of a summary statement from the Lord, identifying, I use that word carefully, identifying the things that we eagerly seek with those things that fill us with worry. You get what I'm saying? He's identifying what we eagerly seek after with the things about which uh, we worry. And do not seek, he says, what you will eat and what you will drink, and do not keep on worrying. In the parallel passage in Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, uh, the Lord repeats again the word worry uh, rather than seek as here. It's as if what we worry about can be discovered in what we seek after. Worry leads to all kinds of useless activity. It is a robber of our time as we go about seeking after things that in fact keep us from the more profitable things to be had in this life. Worry is useless. When Abraham Lincoln was on his way to Washington to be inaugurated, he spent some time in New York with Horace Greeley, the famous uh, newspaper uh, editor. And he told Greeley an anecdote which was meant to be an answer to the question that was on everyone's lips, are we really to have civil war? That's what everybody was talking about. Everyone was anxious to see what was going to happen in the weeks and months ahead. Uh, back in his circuit riding days, Lincoln and his companions uh, riding to the next session of court had crossed many harrowing, swollen rivers, but the dreaded Fox River uh, was still ahead of them. And they were saying to one another, if these streams give us so much trouble, how shall we get over Fox River? Darkness fell and they stopped for the night at a log tavern where they fell in with a Methodist 
presiding elder of the district, a circuit rider who rode uh, throughout the countryside in all kinds of weather, and he knew the Fox River intimately. And so they gathered about him to ask about the present state of the river. Uh, oh, yes, replied uh, the circuit rider. <clears throat> I know all about uh, the Fox River. I have crossed it often and understand it well. But I have one fixed rule with regard to the Fox River. I never cross it till I reach it. <laughs> Here's the lesson. Uh, worry adds the worst to what God only intended for us to take on today. Uh, Jesus said it best in Matthew 6, 34, do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. <clears throat> the psalmist, this is Psalm 37, uh, 25, uh, reflecting upon how the Lord uh, directs our steps for his own delight, concluded, I have been young and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging bread. God takes care of his own. And those who belong to him should rest in the knowledge of that. Worry and anxiety should belong to the world, not to the people of God. And that was what Jesus was saying in verse uh, 30 when he referred to the nations of the world. Let them, let the nations of the world, let all those other people who don't, are not the beloved children of God, let them eagerly seek or worry about all these, these things. You're in a special category. Your father knows that you need these things. That's a powerful encouragement to every believer. Your father knows that you need these things. I love this syllogism. I know you've heard it, I've repeated it, but it's wonderfully true. And I, I think of it as a, a three-sided uh, nest of security or a three-walled uh, fortress of peace. Here we see one wall. God knows. God knows. He's omniscient. And he knows everything. Uh, every concern that is occurring in your life, he even knows the contingent things. If you study theology, you learn that. What has happened, what might happen, what is happening, what could have happened, what is going to happen tomorrow and the days ahead, that's because he has sovereignly ordained the pass of our lives down to the finest details. So he knows. The second thing is, he is omnipotent. He is the all-powerful, sovereign God of the universe who is intimately involved in the lives, actions, and circumstances of his creatures. And there is nothing needed to be done that is impossible for him. He is the almighty, sovereign God, the second wall. But there's yet one more. He loves us with a perfect and infinite love. You see, it would be one thing if God uh, knew the difficulties that face us and he was mighty in power to deliver us. But what if he did not love us and did not care uh, to help us? Or what if he loved us and he was mighty to save us, but he didn't know about our trials so that he could come rescue us from them? Or what if God knew about this thing looming uh, before us, threatening us, and he loved us and desired greatly to save us from it, but he was weak and unable to come to our aid? Well, none of this is the case, though, uh, for our Heavenly Father is almighty in power, comprehensively all-knowing, and His love for us is perfect in every way. It is a three-walled fortress of security and peace that the world does not know. Well, with that admonition uh, established, 
uh, the Lord now moves from the negative instructions to the positive in verse 31, but seek the king, his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. And note the repetition of the word seek. There's all that that the nations of the world eagerly seek. And then there is what Jesus' disciples are to seek. They are to seek God's kingdom. Here, uh, more than anything, is the antidote to worry about the things of this world, the bigger house, the money in the bank, the recognition we desperately desire. All the worldly things that have been the Lord's topic uh, thus far. Freedom from that will come from seeking his kingdom. Uh, everyone who makes that his primary aim will have no need to worry about the things the world finds essential. Disciples of Jesus have by def definition uh, made a decision to follow him and seek after the things that are important to him. If the disciples prayer is thy kingdom come, then the disciples' life is one conformed to having the rule of God govern his life, to embody in his every pursuit in this world until the actual kingdom comes, the kingdom principles and the kingdom attitudes and the kingdom aspirations. It is devoting our time to kingdom pursuits and conducting our lives in a manner that reflects the king that we follow. It is living the beatitudes, uh, praying at all times, uh, growing in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and exercising the spiritual gifts uh, we have received from his hand. It would include anonymously helping those in need, but also giving our material blessings to support the ministry of the gospel. It's living kingdom-minded lives and with a mind to make disciples and thus invest in eternity in the kingdom. It would be conduct resembling Moses, remember, who forsook the ease of a privileged life in Egypt to follow the Lord, as the author of Hebrews uh, put it, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. In short, it's to seek the spiritual treasures, the spiritual blessings of the kingdom. And as one does that, they will find that the king will add these other things that uh, before had been the object of their frantic pursuit. They may not grow wealthy as the world understands wealth, but they'll lack nothing uh, while enjoying the benefits of kingdom life, which is now what the Lord very tenderly adds in verse 32, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. This is a bit of an unusual address coming from the Lord Jesus, little flock, uh, coming as it does from our great shepherd, the good shepherd. It must reflect his understanding of their weakness and of the minority position they will hold in their faithless communities. They are his little flock, and they will certainly find reason to fear in the days ahead. So his comfort to them is that they ought not to fear for this kingdom they are to seek. In their seeking of it, they will find its benefits are already theirs. So rather than striving and worrying after the material things that can never fulfill a person, they are to make a habit of selling their possessions. Make a habit of selling their possessions. As the mirror floats in front of me, make a habit of selling uh, their uh, possessions and giving them to those who are truly needy. Uh, and this will reveal the reality of their decision to seek God's kingdom and give up the treasures of the world. Now, this verse has been misinterpreted uh, frequently. Uh, Jesus does not say to sell all your possessions. That would be irresponsible. Uh, that would require someone else to come take care of you. God has said he'll, he will take uh, care of you. Uh, the meaning is clear from the entirety of the scriptures. 
uh, believers in Christ are to hold their possessions loosely uh, and be ready to show generosity to others in the same way God has been generous to them. So we're to be generous with our material belongings, Jesus says, but then he adds, <clears throat> make yourselves money belts which do not wear out an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near nor moth destroys. So it's very similar, isn't it, uh, to what the Lord said in the Sermon on uh, the Mount. The, the subject of treasure, remember, uh, came up first in verse 21 in the parable of the rich fool who stored up treasure for himself but was not rich toward God. And here the Lord counsels somewhat the opposite. He said in Matthew 6, 20, store up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. And now here in verse 34, he adds and, and he repeats what he said back then in Matthew 6, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The heart and treasure are what we call join at the hip. Wherever one is, you may find the other. For one's heart always follows what one treasures. That's why if we honestly ask ourselves the question, where is my heart? Uh, all we have to do is follow our treasure. You wanna know where your heart is? follow your treasure? Where do we spend our time? How do we direct our energies? What occupies our thoughts? Today's technology companies have learned that. It's, it's part of the key to their phenomenal success. They know how to track our treasure and then they feed it back uh, to us. If you treasure financial gain, they'll feed you financial <laughs> advice ads. If you're absorbed in sports, you'll receive more sports than you could ever uh, use. If it's knitting, knitting, uh, you'll uh, be flooded with offers for more knitting paraphernalia. Whether it's hunting or dogs or politics or video games, the tech companies will know it and they will appeal to your heart because they know where it is. You know, at Christmas, we've got Christmas coming up. We've got, some of us, <laughs> gifts under the tree. Or on birthdays or anniversaries, we exchange gifts, and they're often wrapped in, in paper so that we can't discover what the gift is until we remove the wrapping paper. My wife finds matching wrapping papers all around the tree, but I still don't know what's, what's in there. Uh, but that's what these companies do. Uh, they unwrap our habits and our lusts and where we spend our time and, where we, and, 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 and they find our heart and, and then they feed it. They feed our heart. Jesus says we're to seek his kingdom. We're to lay up treasure in heaven. And we, when we do that, our wise heavenly Father, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, will feed to us all we could ever desire or need. As the apostle put it in Ephesians 3, verse 20, he is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. We have no needs that God is not able to provide for us. But how do we know that? It's because he's already uh, given to us the greatest thing pos he possibly could. We have had two arguments in our study, a minori, from the lesser to the greater. Uh, now here's one, a fortiori, from the greater to the lesser. It's Romans 8.32, of course. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? We have no need to worry about life. 
as to what we'll eat or for our body as to what we'll put on. Our Heavenly Father has already given to us the very greatest thing. It is only logical that now he is able and willing to do for us these lesser things that we encounter in the course of our lives. There's a little catch-all phrase we often use in here in our daily affairs. It's uh, no worries. No worries. It used to be no problem. That fell out of favor. Now it's no worries. Uh, no worries. But for the child of God and Jesus Christ, they're both true. We have no worries because he cares for us. We have no problems. He cannot repair and imbue uh, with grace and mercy. Our Father knows we need these things. Isn't that wonderful? Let's pray. Lord, we are blessed uh, by, to be the recipients of your love, to be the recipient of the unmined resources of your strength, uh, your, uh, uh, your power, your omnipotence, and to know that the things that worry us so much that occupy our thoughts and cause us sleepless nights, uh, you know these things. Uh, you are intimately familiar with them all, and you love us, and we're so grateful uh, to know that. We give you praise and glory, and pray, Lord, that by uh, the sanctifying work of your Holy Spirit, we might be able more and more with great faith to rest in those promises. In Jesus' name, amen.